Hi, and welcome to the Rock Cycle in Depositional Environment lecture. So you may be thinking, what is this cool looking place? I'll tell you what, it's one of my favorites of a state park. It is located in South Dakota in Custer State Park, which is not very far away from Mount Rushmore. And this would be called a lacustrine environment. The reason I want to share this picture is just to kind of frame what we'll be talking about today, because not only do you see rocks in the background, those happen to be igneous rocks, you also see a lake and you can see what would be deposition in the lake. So important to kind of put these two topics together as we make a journey over the next few chapters that you'll be learning about minerals and rocks. So there are just three different types of rocks, which we'll get into shortly. And know that as we dive deeper into each one of these topics over the next few chapters, you'll be learning specific details. So today is more about you getting the big picture and then we kind of focus in on the detail as we go through each one of the topics. So thinking about the image that we saw of Sylvan Lake, let's talk about how the rock cycle applies to that. Sometimes when we're learning about stuff in class, it's hard to see how it relates to our everyday life. And the rock cycle by far is one of the best examples of how geology applies to what we do in the world. For example, every time that you drive a car, you're driving on pavement unless you're on a gravel road. And even then there's dirt and gravel and rocks, but that asphalt or that concrete didn't magically happen. It was made from earthen materials and then mixed with chemicals in a man-made process to simulate what we would have in nature. So the rock cycle plays a vital role in what we have available to us to use as humans for things like building materials, how we build our structures, where that can be a reality. <clears throat> the rock cycle also dictates what we see, what we walk on, the stuff that's inside the earth, so that kind of means we have to scroll back the clock of where do all rocks come from? <laughs> where is the origin? So our solar system is older than Earth. And of course, our solar system is very young in respective to when you start thinking about like the Milky Way and then you start thinking about the universe in general. But our, our just solar system, our small little solar system, which is absolutely huge, if you want to just talk about in human reference, we're about between 4.6 and 5 billion-ish years old for the solar system, but the Earth is 4.56 billion years old. So how do we know that? That's a really important question. So that kind of comes to that really tiny fraction of a percent of rocks that are not from our planet that happen to be residing currently here, which would be extraterrestrial sources of rock material you might know them as meteorites. So meteorites, while they're a tiny little fraction of the rocks that we have available to us, they provide exceptional knowledge of information of being able to do isotopic dating on the age of when they were formed. So giving us a clue into how old our solar system is, our sun, the formation of other planets similar to ours. And then it also helps us with understanding the building blocks of what rocks are made out of, which is minerals. So as we make the journey through the rock cycle, we'll start with minerals when we begin our lessons about the different types of rocks and minerals and fossils. Then we'll move into igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, metamorphic rocks, then fossils. So there are three major rock types and they're all interrelated, but they had to start somewhere. So I mentioned the Earth was 4.56 billion-ish years old, and we can find that information somewhat by looking at the meteorites that I mentioned, but also by understanding how our Earth is made. So we know our inner core is solid. It's made of predominantly nickel and iron. And we also know that the Earth is differentiated into layers. Differentiated meaning the densest minerals sunk to the interior of the earth and the lighter ones floated to the surface, which gives us a crust that's different for continental versus oceanic, the mantle having different 
density versus the crust, and then certainly the outer and the inner cores being very, very different. One being liquid and the inner core, of course, being a solid. All of these things are important to understanding how the rock cycle works, because when you scroll back the clock to the beginnings of the planet Earth, we were a molten planet. And it would take about a while, hundreds of millions of years, before we would get that first crustal outer shell, if you want to call it that, to the planet. Once that happened, we could start triggering what you and I know of as plate tectonics and the various different rock types. But since it was molten, the rock cycle started right here, where I have a star where it says rock cycle started here, magma. Magma is molten rock. It's not the same as lava. While they're often interchangeable terms, I want you to know semantics matter here. Magma started the whole process. And once we started getting an outer shell to the planet, then we could start to have what we call weathering and erosion, which would form a different type of rock known as sedimentary rocks. We could have new volcanoes erupting or rock material making it back into the mantle via subduction. And in between all of those areas, we can make things subsurface called metamorphic rocks. So the point of the rock cycle is to realize there's not just one set order or way that rocks can be made, but it did originate with intrusive or plutonic known as magma igneous rocks. And then we were lucky enough to get an outer shell. And that's how the terrestrial planets in general operated. So as we go through this process, I want you to think about what it means to transition from one place in the rock cycle to the next. So if you take a look at the diagram, I think it'll help explain what the rock cycle does. We didn't just magically get lava eruptions like you see on the right in Hawaii. So I took this picture from a helicopter with the doors off. That's the way to do it if you can and it's safe. And you're certainly completely strapped in when you do it. If you're not, that wouldn't be. <laughs> but doing it really helped me feel the, the heat of the lava. And it also helped me smell the gases. It helped me recognize and hear the sounds associated with volcanism. But just know that a lot of igneous stuff that happens on the planet and inside the planet never makes it to the surface. It may be brought up to the surface as intrusive igneous rock and exposed like a place such as Yosemite National Park in California. That's made up of granite, a lot of it, and diorite. But that would be what you would see in the diagram on the left. If you're taking a look and you see that gray diagram, that inactive magma chamber, many magma chambers never have a volcanic eruption. Some do, and if we do, we'll get something like we see in that lava flow on the right. But understanding that the lava flows were very important for us getting our crustal outer shell to the planet is a vitally important part of understanding the rock cycle. Because once lava existed, these rocks began to get weathered. They began to be broken down, and that's what weathering is, is the breaking down, to help us form sedimentary rocks. And all rocks ultimately can get rechanged into something else. Sometimes they can become metamorphic rocks, which we'll get to here shortly because of heat and or pressure. So let's continue on and talk about igneous rocks since they kind of started the whole rock cycle, the whole meal deal. So remember igneous rocks refer to molten rocks. So there are basically two groups of molten rocks. There are those that are considered as plutonic or intrusive. So intrusive and plutonic are synonymous terms. The prefix in refers to inside the earth. And those are rocks that cool off beneath the surface. So they would have a character like this one right here of granite. So you're going to learn about different textures for all three major rock groups, which is igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. And without overwhelming you today, the two textures for igneous are called phanaritic and aphanitic. So phanaritic would be like this granite where you have interlocking crystals smashed up next to each other because they grew over a long stretch of time. And then aphanitic would be where you see this background's very gray and occasional just black crystal here of a mineral. They're not interlocking because they cooled as lava. 
So that's where volcanic and extrusive textures come into play, which we call aphanitic. You'll get to this when we get to igneous rocks, but just to kind of give you flavor, each igneous rock has a unique set of clues that help us understand how it was derived, the chemistry of the magma chamber, the blending of magmatic material that formed that chemistry, and subsequently if there was an eruption, if it was highly violent or not. These are all things that by the end of this course, you'll have a much better understanding of why those simple little things matter. So igneous chemistry makes a big difference on how an eruption occurs if one even does. So bottom line is you have this chart in your book and it's in the igneous chapter. And we'll be getting into it when we get to that chapter in more detail, but there's some classes what I like to call margarita mixes of igneous rocks. There's felsic, intermediate, mafic, and then ultramafic. So the most explosive ones fall in the felsic. The least explosive fall in the ultramafic. So all of the stuff in the middle here, these are the minerals that make them up. So I wanna kind of take a moment to prelude that minerals make up rocks, not vice versa. And when you're thinking about minerals, the assortment of them makes up the margarita mix. So I used to be a bartender years ago and someone would come to the counter and order a margarita or some kind of specialized drink. And we might have had 10 different recipes to do it, but sometimes you'd get someone that would be very specific about the ingredients they wanted. When we're talking about igneous rocks, it's that margarita mix with specific ingredients that makes it either felsic, intermediate, mafic, and ultramafic. And what's important right now, you're seeing all these rock names, you're like, oh my gosh, am I going to have to learn all of this? The short answer is yes, but it'll make a lot more sense when we get there and you've done the labs. But the plutonic rock or the one with phaneritic texture that's felsic is granite. The one that's lava that's just like it, same margarita mix, would be rhyolite. You come over here into the mafic category, which would be more along the lines of what you'd see in Hawaii. You have just like granite and felsic, you have what's called gabbro. So it's a very dark, usually black with some green maybe, interlocking crystals that cooled over a long time inside the earth. And then you have lava flows like I showed you in Hawaii that are basalt. That would be the lava equivalent. So when we get to igneous rocks, you'll have a, a crash course in understanding how all this works. But for now, we're just kind of giving big picture. Let's move on into sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks also have two major groups. In fact, all three rock groups have two major groups. <laughs> in sedimentary rocks, we could also even say there's a third type, but we'll make it simple for this class. Uh, there's detrital and chemical. Chemical then den can be subdivided into biochemical, chemical, and we'll learn more about that when we get to the sedimentary chapter. So detrital is also another term for clastic. Clastic is the root word clast, which are fragments and pieces of rock. So something like this river, which is along the road of, uh, in Glacier National Park going to the Sun Road is what it's called. There's a road that follows this entire river. It's absolutely gorgeous in Montana. So this river is weathering down rocks. And as it does, these pre-existing rock layers will get made into smaller grains over time. And then they'll get deposited somewhere when the water flows slow enough that it can actually settle out those materials and make a new rock layer. We also have what are called chemical sedimentary rocks. These are not made because a pre-existing rock gets broken up and redeposited. They're made because of one of two primary reasons, the precipitation or what I would call the production of a mineral or some kind of a mineral material that deposits something in water you can probably relate to that if you put sugar or Splenda in your iced tea and a, a solid precipitates out. If you've ever done a chemistry experiment and you've seen a solid get created because two chemicals are mixed together, that is what a precipitate is. And then little microscopic dead organisms can accumulate and make sediments as well. So that's another way that we make sedimentary rocks. So the old fashioned way is by, ero by weathering and erosion. So weathering, breaking up of rock fragments into other rock layers. 
And then the actual production of making new sediments of chemical nature. So let's define what weathering and erosion really is. Weathering is just that, it's breaking down of rock material. That can happen bit by bit by bit. That can be just water moving a little bit here and there. It can be a beach line that's being just hammered by a coastline. It can be by chemical weathering that you see over here. This is a really gorgeous place. When you take a look at it, it is actually in Zion National Park. And you can see all the staining on the rock. That is a form of chemical weathering. So this material has been weathered out. And once the weathered sediments are gone and they've been taken away, that's referred to as erosion. So let's take a peek at this type of status, which is the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon represents both. You have weathering that occurs every day, but the removal of a mile deep hole in the ground that's up to 17 miles wide, that's erosion. Those sediments had to go somewhere and be redeposited. They're made into new sedimentary rock layers more than likely. This bent tree trunk on the left is an example of a weathering process. It's uh, actually called a creep. Like, yes, like human creeps, but they're geology creeps. And what's happened is the tree is coming out. It's growing out because of coming out through a rock. And so it's looking for sunshine. So it bends its trunk and goes in an upward direction. Well, that, it, that creeping is actually a form of weathering and can break up rocks. But remember, there's a difference between weathering and erosion. And those terms actually do matter. So when we're talking about the process of sedimentary rock formation. All sedimentary rocks go through a procedure, whether they are clastic slash detrital or they're chemical slash biochemical. They all have to come from the deposition of weathered sediments or the deposition of freshly made sediments, such as chemical sedimentary rocks. Then those sediments are compacted because weight gets put on top of them, usually new rock layers. It's just like you squishing down on your trash to remove air space. As that happens, fluids may be between those spaces and rocks and they can act as a cementing agent, almost like an Elmer's glue. So that adds to the cementation. And then the compaction and cementation ultimately leads to what we call the hardening of a rock, which is when it's lithified or lithification. So you're looking at a beach here in South Point, Hawaii. A lot is going on here. It's also a, one of the only green sand beaches that you can find. There's very few of them in the world. And that green sand, you'll learn more about it in this class, is formed in very mafic and sometimes ultra mafic conditions for igneous rocks. But it's making a sedimentary rock layer here of sand. So over time, this is gonna get deposited, it's then it's gonna get compacted, then it's gonna get glued together, and ultimately it's gonna harden, which is the term lithify. That's the procedure that all sedimentary rocks go through, which moves us into the third rock type, which is metamorphic rocks. So metamorphic rocks are by far the least common of the three. The most common that you will see on the surface is likely sedimentary rocks because that makes up a bulk of what's at the surface. But a lot of the Earth's rocks are actually igneous. So I'm not saying that you're never gonna see a metamorphic rock, that's just not true, you will. But they have the least probable area on the planet to get made because the majority of them are made from about right beneath the surface to about 55 kilometers beneath the surface. And there's a distinctive reason why, and you're gonna find out when we get to metamorphic rocks. But they're just like there was for igneous and sedimentary, there happen to be two major types of textures, foliated and non-foliated. And before you're like, oh my gosh, all these terms. Well, we're gonna learn them with each rock layer. This is just a kind of a big picture of what you're fixing to be exposed to as we get into minerals, rocks, and fossils. Foliated rocks typically have some type of an alignment of their crystals in a more parallel fashion because there's a lot of pressure that's been added. Heat is also a factor. When we think of non-foliated, we have a lot less pressure, but more heat that's causing these crystals to 
reshape themselves. And as they do, the more heat's applied, the higher the grade of metamorphism, the bigger those crystals can be recrystallized. So metamorphic rocks are some of the most remarkable that we have on the planet because they just make some of the coolest stuff. For example, schist is a, for most part, glittery because it has a lot of muscovite and mica in it, but it can also have garnets. And you're going to see how that forms and, and why it forms. There's very unique temperatures and pressure conditions that can form them. So metamorphic rocks are great evidence of clues of an area of how it might have been impacted in geologic paths. So you find a mica schist that has garnets in it in your, let's say, in California. Well, that can give you a lot of information that you probably had a plate collision. That plate collision likely caused a subduction zone where we had one plate subducting underneath another, an ocean plate under a continental plate. And then we had partial melting and lots of pressure, which did all kinds of interesting things to the rocks that were being subducted, which created things like garnet schist. More to come on metamorphic rocks. But this is a chart that's in your metamorphic chapter, and it's kind of like the igneous chart I showed you a minute ago. These are all the minerals, but what I want to focus in on is that garnet for a second. So you can see if you take a line straight down that maybe have a garnet or two in phyllite and maybe a garnet or two in nice, but look at the rock that has most of it. It's schist right here. But you also look at the intermediate grade of temperature. So you look at the low grade, the high grade. Once you get past high grade and you start getting to a point where you can actually melt rocks, we've gotten out of metamorphic and back into igneous category of the rock cycle. So these minerals that are in the middle here, the feldspar and quartz fall, form in all of these different conditions, but you can see some of these only form in a handful of temperature conditions, which means rocks that contain them, that tells us right away about the conditions in which they were formed. So we care about metamorphic rocks a lot because they give us a good glimpse into what was happening on the planet in the inside of the earth. Like I mentioned, metamorphic rocks typically don't form in large concentrations below 55 kilometers, simply because it's hot enough when you get below that point that we have molten or semi-molten rock. So a majority of what we have for metamorphic rocks forms right at the surface around zero kilometers to about 55 kilometers. And then starting around 55 kilometers, you have a zone of molten rock. And that's where we often form a lot of our hotspots that create things like volcanoes. Let's talk about magma and magmatism. Not magnetism, but magmatism. <laughs> Very big difference. Eventually, most rocks are subducted back into the mantle. So we're constantly losing crust. You learned about mid-oceanic ridges and you know how that is being pushed away from a spreading center at the bottom of the ocean floor. And when it, an ocean crust hits continental crust, it's denser than the continental crust, so it sinks. And this area right in here, it's going to be blending as it's melting and the continental crust is melting as this stuff is being sent down into the subsurface. And that causes blending. That gets back to that margarita mix for igneous rocks. So magma blending is a really important part of the rock cycle. And it dictates what can be at the surface subsequently. Once you get igneous rocks at the surface, they get weathered and turned into things like sedimentary rocks. But just because you have a sedimentary rock doesn't mean that it automatically becomes a metamorphic rock or another uh, igneous rock. It might turn into a different sedimentary rock on its recycle moment. You have to think about the rock cycle as just that. It's a giant recycling machine of the earthen materials that we have on the planet. So some rocks may stay in their original form for billions of years, which makes them exceptionally important for geologic knowledge. <laughs> Those that are extremely old, we value in terms of giving us glimpses into geologic past. Other things we look at are things like zircons, which are minerals. Zircons sometimes are mistaken for diamonds. They're not one in the same, but zircons are some of the oldest minerals. They were the first to crystallize when the earth was molten. And so they kind of have a coating every time they've gone through some type of an event, like a metamorphic event. So we can kind of see 
one event after another, layer after layer after layer, and that provides us a really rich knowledge of the Earth's history. So in summary, just remember that their rock cycle started with, with magma, molten rock. Once we started getting lava at the surface with molten rock again, but not magma, remember they're two very different terms, then we could start making our sedimentary rocks by weathering and erosion of igneous rocks. And then more igneous rocks might have gotten metamorphosed or sedimentary rocks subducted into the mantle. The point is, is that this is a continuous process and there's no straight line that goes just directly from igneous to sedimentary, sedimentary to metamorphic. It is a process where you can skip a, a stage, go to another one, or you can remain an igneous rock for billions of years. So the point is that our rocks are stories and every story has clues in them. Those rocks each contain clues. This course is all about learning what those clues are and how to recognize them. Which moves us into some of the biggest clues that we have, which are depositional environments. Depositional environments represent the environment that created what we see on the planet. Now, you're seeing an active glacial depositional environment up here. Y'all can see the glacier. You're like, yep, I buy that. That's glaciers. Well, what if the ice was missing and I was left with these really steep walled and a U-shaped valley here? I would still know a glacier formed it, even if there was no ice, because it did it in geologic past. This is a lake environment known as a lacustrine environment. Maybe a lake today, but maybe it wasn't in the past. So we have to look at the rocks that we find, rock layers in particular, to decipher how they were made. Those clues are extremely important. So this is a picture of the Waco wetlands, which would be the equivalent of a swamp. Most swamps, those have trees. We don't really have a bunch of trees that are in the wetlands itself because it's a man-made wetlands. But each sedimentary rock uh, forms in a depositional environment. And certain rocks, just simply based on the size of the material that makes up that sedimentary rock, creates very calm, no energy waters, like really tiny microscopic almost sized grains would require very calm, no energy conditions. And then you get giant boulder sized materials that would require just an enormous amount of energy to transport them. Those are all clues that we used to help us understand depositional environments. But to be specific, the depositional environment that we care about in geology is the environment by which and in which these rocks were formed when they were made, not what it may be today. Sometimes they can be one and the same. That's sheer luck. For example, if you go to Death Valley National Park in California, that is a desert Aeolian environment for sure. And it was when it was made as well, <laughs> but not 100% of its existence has always been a desert. So you have to look and you have to look at all the clues that are around to get that information. So depositional environments are looking at ancient geologic conditions that form the rocks that we have out there. So right here, this is Shark Bay, Australia, one of the two places on the planets where stromatolites are made. And there's all kinds of ripple marks. You can kind of see them. It's not just the water, but in the sand there, that's what's created over here, which are called ancient ripple marks. So we can use things like these types of clues. We can use other things that are in rocks to help us understand the conditions by which these rocks were formed. So let's talk about sedimentary facies or facies. Facies are different types of sedimentary rocks and layers that formed in similar or consistent depositional environments. So this is a carbonate facies or facies, and that refers to open ocean. This is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. I'm in a helicopter looking down here. And the depth might surprise you that some of this in here is certainly over 80 feet deep, and then other areas are super shallow. So it's very diverse. <laughs> the Great Barrier Reef is just thousands of little reefs compacted together. This is its own depositional environment, creates a distinctive set of rock layers that's unique to this environment. 
And that's what a facies represents or a facies. You can pronounce it either way, facies or facies. All rock layers that are made in depositional environments create rock layers known as strata. Strata is the root word of stratigraphic. Stratigraphic refers to the study of rock layers. So depositional environments make very specific rock layers. Like if I remember taking my mom for the first time to see Zion National Park and we were on the east side of the park. We were there on the 4th of July weekend and this was her last big trip uh, when she was still alive. And she, we were just standing in line and <laughs> trying to move in the car and she says, those look like pancakes. So I got out and took a pancake rock picture for her. But it was a great look at rock strata because rock layers just make that, they make layers. And each layer tells a story. But those layers represent the certain conditions or depositional environment in which these rocks were made when they were being developed. In the case of Zion, they were made in a giant desert or Aeolian environment. So we're gonna talk about three major groups of depositional environments. One's for terrestrial, one's transitional, and then the last is what we refer to as marine. So terrestrial is all rocks that are made on land, but don't be deceived, land can also involve aqueous or water environments, things like lakes, okay, rivers, streams, groundwater. What they don't include are, are, are transitional uh, environments such as a, a beach or a near shore environment, and it doesn't include the wide open ocean. So those are the excluders of terrestrial. This is by far uh, very diverse. So we're gonna look at this, this group right here, and they kind of follow along in your book, and we're gonna go through each one and define them. So starting today, you will know how to pronounce these, and you'll be required to know what the term that goes with rivers is, lakes, deserts, ice, so forth. Fluvial, Apisim foxtrot, fluvial, means rivers. Rivers are very diverse. So there's some that are roaring rapids and some that are very slow moving like the one you see here. And rivers are where water is moving over the continent by streams, tributaries, and even some deltaic deposits. So rivers, extremely important. So from this day forward, you will be calling them fluvial depositional environments. So why is it so important to know what a fluvial deposition looks like? Because if you see a rock layer and you see a nice rounded class like you see here, and they're all kind of pointed in the same direction, that kind of shows us the flow of the river and shows us the size and the speed and the energy of that river that could pick up a certain size grain sediment. Because if you look at the Swiss army knife, as a scale, some of these are very large. That means you'd have to have a pretty fast moving river to move those from time to time. So each river has its own set of qualities, but we can look at certain types of uh, deposition and class size, meaning sediment size, and its shape, meaning the morphology, like the roundness of these, helps us understand how it was made. Lacustrine refers to lake-derived sediments. This is Lake Mead right outside of Las Vegas. And uh, if you had been there in the last few years, you might've seen an even more dramatic bathtub ring where the lake levels dropped. Hopefully it will be going up with recent ring, but it's a constant battle as we have more population moving into the area and more usage and less uh, snow melt coming off of the mountains that helps recharge this. Lacustrine water bodies are, typically make finer grain sediments as compared to something like fluvial. So fluvial can make things like maybe some siltstones, but predominantly sandstones and conglomerates, where lacustrine is going to make things like siltstones and shales, otherwise known as mudstone. The reason is shale and mudstone is super fine grain. So if you think back to the example of Splenda versus granular sugar, Granular sugar would be like the sands and sandstone, and then the clay-sized particles that make up uh, shale or mudstone is like the Splenda. So it takes a lot more of the Splenda-sized sediments to make a layer that's a foot thick than it would of the granular uh, type of sugar 
that could be made up of your very large sandstones that you might see in a fluvial deposit. The reason being is lacustrine environments do not have high energy conditions for the most part that are naturally occurring. So you will typically have just slow settling of fine grain sediments to the bottom of the lake, and that's what makes up the sediments that are there. Eolian refers to desert and wind. So this is a great shot, took it my first year on field course. This is in uh, the uh, painted desert and petrified forest, specifically the petrified forest side of the park. And you can see there's a huge storm coming, which is very unusual out in the desert. But when it does, this was monsoon season, so it was July, flash floods can come. And in the desert, the desert environments like the petrified forest was not always a desert environment, an Eolian environment. In fact, there were big, large trees here that made up a forest. So the depositional environments changed over time. That's why we look at other clues and rocks like what's in the rock, fossils and minerals and other things that can help us determine more information about how these rocks were made, where they were made, and even when they were made. So glaciers are probably the easiest, but again, if you don't see a glacier present in the current tense, you might be a little surprised what is considered glaciated and non-glaciated. When we get to that towards the end of the semester, I will open your eyes to a whole world of how different glaciated environments can look. But glaciers, uh, depositional environments mean they were impacted and, and oftentimes deposited, eroded, and sculpted by glaciers from some time in geologic past. Swamps. So swamps typically have trees. Uh, there are various different types of swamps. So you can have something more like the man-made wetlands in, in Waco, Texas that we have, or you can have something that looks like this. Before humans started building dams, a lot of our rivers looked more like this. So today, true swamps don't have a whole bunch of energy in the water. So we typically have what we would see at the bottom of a lacustrine or lake environment, which is fine, fine grain sediments settling to the bottom. Especially since they're trees and those organic byproducts like leaves and the just the trees themselves dying, they decay into organically rich layers known as coal. So coal is a bio uh, some chemical sedimentary rock and we use it as a form of fossil fuels. So swamps, coal, direct correlation there. I'm not saying every swamp will generate it, but I'm telling you that we do look for these rocks for that very, very reason. All right, so let's move from the terrestrial, which is the online, depos meaning on land, depositional environments to the transitional. That means from land to the ocean. That's the stuff where you can have characteristics of both. So that's a pretty easy one to guess. Beaches are gonna be that way. Even some uh, delta deposits could be, but most deltas fall under the river deposits and then your shoreline. So let's talk about uh, tidal flats and beaches. This gorgeous place is in Washington state and this is a great look at a transitional environment. Not far from where I am there is another transitional environment where water is coming off of the continent draining into the Pacific Ocean. These are the transitional areas. So as sea level goes up and down over time, this could become buried. I'm just going to say, let's see if sea level rose maybe 100 feet. I could bury a majority of these trees, which would kill all this organic material, making a lot of organically rich mud, which could then produce something like a swamp or a coal. So wanting you to see that we can end up having some unique circumstances happen over time with our transitional depositional environments. Probably the most important besides a beach is tidal flats. Tidal flats are depositional transitional environments. They are marine environments, but they are subjected to high and low tide, which makes them transitional because they're dry, then they're wet. They're dry, then well, wet. So you typically will see siltstones and some maybe smaller grain sandstones, but you'll see a lot of what we call ripple marks in these. And you can even see 
some of those forming just naturally on the land there. Tidal flats have slow moving water as the tide rises and falls. These are those stromatolites again. So those stromatolites might be buried for part of the day underwater and then exposed for another part of the day. So tidal flats have very unique biological life that lives there. So we can look at fossil communities in the rock record. We can look at the types of rock structures like uh, ripple marks, even uh, if you might even have mud cracks on an unusual circumstance. Another transitional area is the beach line. And the beach line is your shoreline. These are the areas along continental edges where wave action has eroded rock material, weathered it down and redeposited some of it along a beach. So you will see this at long shallow marine areas and not all shoreline generates beaches, <laughs> but the beach material is a direct reflection of the rock material and also the living organisms that might be right offshore. Which brings us into the third major category. So we've had terrestrial, we've had transitional, now we're getting into the open ocean, which is marine. Marine or oceanic depositional environments refer to rock and rock layers that were made from shallow marine environments, just a couple of feet deep, all the way to your deep trenches and everything in between. So that makes it the most variable of all of the three major groups of depositional environment categories. So it's literally what forms in a trench is going to be completely different than that is forming in a coral reef that may be 50 yards or you know 150 yards off the shoreline. So very unique circumstances as you're looking at the different environments. So we're talking about marine, it can be anywhere from something like you see the Great Barrier Reef, that which is near shore. It could be open lagoons, it could be the wide open ocean, your continental shelf, which may be uh, 500 miles offshore. It could be your continental slope, which is where it dives into the deep ocean floor, which is the abyssal plain. It can even include your deepest sea trenches and your mid-oceanic ridges. That means that this depositional environment is completely diverse. So you have to know more about the character of rocks and understand that certain rocks typically form in marine environments, like limestone is predominantly formed in marine environments, which is a clue when you find it. Rocks also can claim, contain other clues, clues about how they were made simply, when you're looking at sedimentary rocks, if you look here, you'll see a conglomerate with predominantly rounded sediments, and then you'll see a big giant uh, breccia over here, and then you see a rounded cobble. So certain size sediments can tell you things, how the shape of the sediments can tell you things. So the clasped shape, you compare the breccia here to the conglomerate, see the rounded texture for majority versus over here where it's very angular. So the story would be this, this stuff got buried probably in a rock fall or some kind of mass wasting event. This one got picked up by a flood and then deposited and the water level dropped and it all went and just kind of fell into a layer. Which one got carried further? The one that's the rounded edges because it used to look like this, but after bouncing around at the bottom of a river, it lost its angular edges. Which brings me to rounded and angular sediment texture. We care because we can look at how rounded or sub-rounded or angular something is. And that helps us kind of categorize, all right, what kind of depositional environment formed this? Was it something like a fluvial environment? Was it flash flooding? Was it a mass wasting event? So we have lots of information for that. If something's rounded, it typically tumbled around at the bottom of a river basin or a fluvial depositional environment. When you see something like this, the brachia, that indicates sharp edges, freshly weathered and quickly buried. So it didn't get very far in the travel path away from its source rock. That's a story in itself. There are a few other clues we look for in rocks. We look for body fossils and trace fossils. Here's a photo of Mammoth W, often referred to as Wanda at the Waco Mammoth National Monument. I love this fossil. Uh, she got her teeth cleaned a little bit too happy by the prepper on this, but Wanda's a great specimen and 
these are actual bones. They're actual body fossils. Sometimes a body fossil might be a shell of an animal, like a clam. It could be a different type of material. Sometimes we have what we call trace fossils, which are evidence that a fossil is in the neighborhood, but not the actual fossil itself. So you're gonna learn about all different types of fossils when we get a little later after the three rock types. We'll do fossils then, and we'll learn about the differences between various body and trace fossils and how they're preserved. Preservation's another clue. So lots of things you have to start thinking about when you're analyzing depositional environments of rocks. A few other clues that are super important, cross bedding is one. We predominantly see this in sandstone units and there's two different types of cross beds. There's those that form in rivers and there's those that form in deserts. <laughs> and you may go, well, how different could they be? The angle of deposition is vitally important. So in a river, cross beds typically are very low in their degree of angle, so usually less than 10 degrees. Cross beds that are aeolian are usually right around the 31-ish degree angle. That is super important to understanding a clue of how and when and what environment they were formed. So this is Zion National Park and some of the best cross bedding you'll see in the world is there, clearly at a high angle. So this would represent Eolian or desert cross beds. Sometimes these cross beds get wiped off the top poof, like that. And so you'll see angles and then you'll see a flat layer, angled and then a flat layer, angled and a flat layer. Those are called truncated dunes. And that tells a story in the fact that as these were still in their sand format, you had a storm event come in and wipe off the top of that cross bed, making it a nice flat surface. The new cross get breads got deposited on top. That's all a truncated dune represents. The ripple marks are super clues. I love these things. You can see my foot on one in Glacier National Park, and then this would be the environment by which you would see in a tidal flat. So oftentimes we see ripple marks in slow moving water areas, and sometimes they're preserved. And you may be thinking, how is that possible? Part of it's luck. Not everything's preserved in the rock record or fossil record. And part of it's just rapid burial. But when they do, they give us clues. Well, some of my favorites are mud cracks, and here's some mud cracks also right next door to those ripple marks where my shoe was. Uh, mud cracks often form in very aeolian or dry, wet, dry, wet, dry cycle area. This is Death Valley over here on the left, and you can see those same cracks. You might have seen these in your yard during the summer. Sometimes they get preserved in the rock record, giving us a clue about the conditions that were present when that rock was Lithified. Can you remember what lithified means? You got it, hardened. There's another set of clues. These are harder to understand and we'll get this into more detail in sedimentary rocks, which are called graded beds. Make it easy. Do you see the big sediments here? Correlate that over here. Medium size here, medium here. Little bitty, little bitty up here. Graded beds represent this process by which big sediments fall out first, medium, then tiny stuff. Then you might get a whole new layer of this indicating a sequence of changes. This can happen because of repetitious changes in the depositional environment, predominantly in a fluvial or river setting. For example, you get these giant boulders. This is actually in the petrified forest and these boulders are as big as my head, some of them, huge. Uh, not meaning my head, but meaning the rocks themselves, just as a perspective of a, a human head. And then some of them are just little bitty grains of size. But the big rocks can't be picked up except in a massive flood event. Just cannot happen. And so to see this kind of graded bed where you get giant stuff, then middle sized stuff, then tiny little stuff, and then the sequence starts all over again, tells us that we have a flash flood, went to regular flow conditions. Next set of big rocks is a flash flood and regular flow conditions. So it's another clue that we use in rocks. So see how your memory is. If you saw this kind of depositional environment, what would it represent today? And if you guessed a swamp, you're in the right category. That's likely what your swamp conditions would look like in geologic past with more trees. 
was this terrestrial? Was it transitional? Was it marine? So transitional is probably the right choice. It's kind of teetering in that middle spot, right? Ah, so this is Death Valley, very Eolian in nature. All right, what was this? What type of depositional environment? And if you guess tidal flat, you're right on, spot on. We're right along that shoreline. Ooh, hmm. You're like, well, I see snow. That's got to be a glacier. There's no glacier there, but there's evidence there used to be one. There's a giant U-shaped valley where the ice used to exist and very steep walls. While there's not a glacier there today, there used to be. So that's a glacier depositional environment. Look at the flowing water. What would this be right here? And if you guess fluvial, you're correct. Yeah, there are glaciers back here on Mount Rainier, but sometimes you got to start looking holistically at all the depositional environments that could possibly have been in place. What's the water body referred to? It's lacustrine. Very good. Here's another one of those dramatic landscapes. This is my favorite place on the entire planet. <laughs> it is Milford Sound on the South Island of New Zealand. And this was radically formed by ancient glaciation. So clues that we have to help understand the rocks around us. When you think about this type of depositional environment, think about the fact that it is that transitional beach line, right? So we can have, if you start getting way out here, we're probably gonna be in the marine. Even here, you could probably start to get to marine. But right along here is that beach line, that's your transitional depositional environment. Again, which is the flowing water called? You need to know this for your testing measures, and that would be fluvial. What kind of clue does this tell you? Was it, would this be a transitional depositional environment? Would it be marine? Would it be terrestrial? Before you jump to the conclusion, I think you need to know that this is not a swimming animal because you don't have a full picture of it. If you could recognize what it is, this is from Dinosaur National Monument. This is actually a land-bearing animal, so it'd be terrestrial. However, this organism, very common in central Texas, is a marine animal known as an ammonite. So its presence in rock automatically tells us, yep, this was a marine depositional environment. These clues can tell us additional pieces of information. Was it dry, then wet? Was it a mud flat? Was it a tidal flat? What was going on? Just start looking for additional clues when you're seeing rock layers. As we wrap it up, I want you to think back to the rock cycle, and then I want you to look at the Grand Canyon. This is the South Rim, matter of fact, right by where if you were stopping at the geology exhibit on the South Rim, you could see this. And I want you to see that each of those layers tells a story. Each layer was made a little differently. They had different depositional environments. Some were more similar than others. For example, this real pretty kind of marbly layer right here was formed high angle cross beds. You've learned that that would be Aeolian, like a desert. You see this really dramatic layer right in here, the red wall limestone. That is a marine rock layer. The top layer, way at the top, is also a limestone layer known as the Kaibab limestone. The layers way right about in here, starting to get towards the ravine. These layers represent a, a sea level from a shoreline to like a coral reef lagoon, then to an open ocean. So lots of stuff going on. So when you start looking at rock layers, especially vertically in the Grand Canyon, you have to start looking at each one and how they're different and the clues that are in them to help you decipher what we can analyze as geologists to know the most we can about how the earth was made. I'll see you when you get to minerals and more to come on that. Thanks for hanging in there with me on rock cycle and depositional environments. See you at the next stop. Bye.